Good Sunday morning and welcome to the March 24th, 2024 edition of the Pastor's Porch. I'm Pastor Brian Schmidt, pastor of Calvary Alliance Church in Hiawassee, Georgia. And as you can tell, we are on the Pastor's Porch today. And to, just to kind of let you know, this is actually the third attempt at doing the Pastor's Porch this week. I tried it yesterday on the Pastor's Porch right here, but it was way windy and it was shaking the camera going like that. And uh, my notes were everywhere in the Bible, wasn't staying open and it was kind of rough. So I thought, oh, I'll do it later. And I happened to have a bus trip. I thought I'll do it on the bus trip while the uh, soccer team was playing soccer and tried that. And I got through the whole thing, got to the very end. And then I ran out of storage on my phone and it cut the video off. And it's like, oh, man. So this is actually third time, third time's a charm. Got Winston, the official sermon of observer right there. Glad that he's watching today as well. All right. So I, to start off with today. Something I like to share with you, uh, and I've printed them off, so the the quality might not be the best, but uh, it gets my point across. I have here, let's try it like this, all right? This is a chart of U.S. Army aircraft during World War II, right? And so here's the aircrafts and uh, their various silhouettes, uh, and uh, really cool, right? And then we also have silhouettes of Japanese aircraft. And then also silhouettes, and this one's actually in German, it's not very good, German aircraft as well. And what's really cool is back during World War II, the Army, because there wasn't an Air Force at the time, would put together little flip books and little decks of kind of like playing cards, but they would have the silhouettes of aircraft on these cards and these flip charts, and so it was so our people could get to know what our our aircraft look like and what the enemy aircraft look like and then just to kind of give it more illustration here's a b-25 mitchell and somebody would memorize this and if up in the sky they saw a twin engine bomber and it had twin rudders on the back instead of a single rudder they'd say oh that's a b-25 mitchell that's one of ours uh and then here's one of my favorite planes of all time it's probably the most pretty ugly or ugly ugly pretty airplane it's the pby catalina <laughs> Somebody would be able to tell it has a really high mono wing there and the engines are mounted real up high and it has a uh, a boat for a fuselage. A, a, the fuselage is like a boat and that's because it was a float plane and a uh, marvelous plane, just incredible. Used for <coughs> reconnaissance. It was a PBY that found the Japanese fleet uh, at the beginning of the Battle of Midway. It was used for anti-submarine warfare. But most importantly, it was used for rescuing uh, downed airmen and sailors that were lost at sea. So neat aircraft. Here's another one that people would be able to look at and say, oh yeah, that's a P-38 Lightning because we got the twin booms there. We knew that plane. And then this is my favorite plane uh, of the United States. This is the Corsair. And somebody would be able to see a Corsair coming at them and say, hey, that's a Corsair because it has this gull wing right there. And no, no other plane had that gull wing. Pretty plane, awesome plane. All right, but then we would have planes of other countries as well, not just our own. Here's an English Spitfire, and it has that elliptical wing. Somebody would be able to tell that as a Spitfire. And then this is a Frackwolf 190. It was a German plane, and it had a really narrow fuselage towards the back, as did the Messerschmitt. But anyway, there was that. And then, of course, the Japanese aircraft, just one of those. Here's a Japanese Zero, and uh, you could notice the, the layout of the wings there and, and the silhouette, the canopy up here on top. People would say, oh yeah, that's a zero. Very important during World War II so that our guys would know who the enemy was and who our people are, all right? And, and that's very important. And it illustrates the point that we must be able to recognize and defend against our enemies, all right? Now, not just in war warfare, but even spiritually as well. It's very important that we understand that our enemy, the devil, and, and know how to ad receive and address and respond to his attacks. And Peter addresses this in two verses in 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 8 through 9, where he gives us two simple little points. One is recognize your enemy, and then the second one is resist your enemy. All right, we're going to talk about recognizing your enemy first, and that's from verse number 8, where it says, be sober, be vigilant, and I have a hard time with that word vigilant. Sometimes I'll get the G in the wrong place, I'll say vigilant. All right, so if I happen to do that, just know that I mean vigilant, all right? This is one of those words I have trouble with. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So first, it's an 
we got to recognize our enemy, all right? And, and first, just a note about who our enemy is. You cannot recognize them if you don't know who they are. And Peter uses two descriptive names to describe our enemy. First of all, he calls them the adversary. He says, your adversary, all right? Adversary means opponent, but not just an opponent like in a game, all right? If, if you're playing Mexican train with dominoes or you're playing uh, chess or there's an athletic event like football or baseball or basketball, we have an opponent, all right? That, that's not really the meaning of the word here, all right? This word comes from a Greek word that has two parts to it. That means against and then justice or a judge, all right? It's a justice, it's a judge uh, who's against something, all right? Uh, we would call a person like this today a prosecuting attorney, all right? One who brings charges against an opponent in a lawsuit, all right? And our adversary, the devil, is always looking for ways to bring charges against God's people, all right? He is always looking for some slip-up on our part to exploit for his purposes, one of which is to accuse us before God. And there's a, a poem that has been one of my favorites since I was a kid. I think I memorized it when I was in, in school. And it's by a lady named Martha Snell Nicholson. It's called My Advocate. And it illustrates the point of what the devil does against us as our opponent, as the prosecuting attorney, as our adversary. This is called My Advocate and says, I sinned and straightway, post haste, which means what? Very quickly, Satan flew before the presence of the Most High God and made a railing accusation there. He said, this soul, this thing of clay and sod, has sinned. Tis true that he has named thy name, but I demand his death. For thou hast said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Shall not thy sentence be fulfilled? Is justice dead? Send now this wretched sinner to his doom. What other thing can righteous ruler do? And thus he, the adversary, Satan, did accuse me day and night, and every word he spoke, Oh, God was true. And if we left it there, that'd be pretty sad. But we do have a second verse. It says, Then quickly one arose from God's right hand, before whose glory angels veiled their eyes. He spoke. Each jot and tittle of the law must be fulfilled. The guilty sinner dies. But wait. Suppose his guilt were all transferred to me, and I paid his penalty. Behold, my hands, my side, my feet. One day I was made sin for him and died that he might be presented faultless at thy throne. And Satan fled away. Full well he knew that he could not prevail against such love. For every word my dear Lord spoke was true. What a neat poem. But it does illustrate this point that Satan is our adversary. He is our opponent. He is the prosecuting attorney. He is making accusation against us before the throne of God, trying to drag us down. But uh, he's kind of like, a bulldog prosecuting attorney. I just learned that word this week. I had no idea. But uh, a prosecuting attorney or a divorce attorney that's just tough as nails is called a bulldog attorney. Did you know that? Well, that's what Satan is. He is a bulldog attorney. He's a bulldog prosecuting attorney. But praise the Lord, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is our all-powerful, loving, and gracious defense. It is through him that we are declared innocent before the throne of God. So praise the Lord for that. So to two descriptive names. The first one is adversary. And then there in verse 8, he calls him the devil. And the devil is similar to adversary, right? Uh, it means to be slanderous, to accuse falsely. It's from a Greek word that means to throw across either with rocks or words, all right? To throw something out there to either verbally or otherwise trying to cause harm, all right? Trying to throw something out there and see what sticks, all right? The old adage, sticks and stones may break my bones but words will never hurt me, all right? Just throwing stuff, seeing what's happening. So the devil has the idea of throwing out accusations with malice, with the intent to hurt and do damage. But who does he lie to? Well, he lies to God the Father, as we've already seen, all right? He goes before the throne of God, and, and, and even as he did with the Job from the Old Testament. But you know what? He also attacks, he lies to, us as individual believers. Sometimes he comes alongside and he whispers in our ear and he'll say things like, are you really saved? He might come alongside and say, hey, you know what? You're not good enough for Jesus to love you. Or he might say, God can't forgive you. You know what you've done. Remember that thing back there when you were 18, 19, whatever? 
And, and so the devil, he comes and, and he puts thoughts in our heads and, and he falsely accuses us even to ourselves. He is our adversary. He is the devil. But as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, he says, lest Satan should take advantage of us, he says this, for we are not ignorant of his devices. All right? Paul says we, sh we should be aware of how Satan works. We should be aware of his M.O., right? his method of operation. And Peter implies that we must be able to recognize Satan in his attacks. And this requires two things, to recognize Satan. He says here, be sober. Right? That word uh, has to do with what one thinks, what's going on in his head. All right, And to be sober is the opposite of being drunk. And if somebody's drunk, what are they? They have impaired judgment. They have impaired reaction time. Their reasoning is off. All right, The opposite of being drunk, though, is to have presence of mind, to have clear judgment, to have an understanding of reality of what's really going on. There's a term that I've heard in the news lately called situational awareness. And there have been people in the news in recent times that have found themselves in very precarious and dangerous situations because they were not using situational awareness. They put themselves in a place where they were in danger. They should have been sober-minded. They should have had a sense of reality in what was really going on and not been there in the first place. All right. So uh, as my coach would have said when I was... Uh, in high school, and, and maybe I was having an off game, he would say, get your head in the game, Schmidt, right? That's what this word means, get your head in the game. Or as Jesus would say to believers, he would say this, get your head in the book, get your head in the book, because the best way to be sober-minded is to be Bible-minded, right? As D.L. Moody said, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And that is so true, all right? If we're not in the book, we're going to be more likely to sin. We're going to be more likely to fall into the traps that Satan sets for us, all right? So be sober-minded. Get your head in the game. Get your head in the book. Psalm 119, verse 11, the psalmist says, Your word have I hid in my heart. Not just his head, not just the intellectual thing, but when you have it in your heart, it becomes a part of you, all right? You're living it. He said, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Peter says, be sober-minded, be sober. And then he says, be vigilant, all right? We'll say it right, be vigilant. Sober-minded has the idea of what you think. Vigilant has the idea of what one sees, all right? It has the idea of perception, to be awake, to a watch. And again, another thing my coach would tell me when I was a kid is pay attention, pay attention, all right? It is interesting in scripture, the many times that watching, that word watching, watch, therefore, is linked with praying, all right? Watch and pray. Jesus in the garden with his disciples said, watch and pray that you fall not into temptation. Later on, Jesus told his disciples as, uh, that as they were going to wait for him to return, he told them to watch and pray many times. And so the best way for a believer to be vigilant is to to pay attention is to be in a constant attitude of prayer, to have that uh, lifestyle of prayer, that 24-7, that, that we have prayer, that we have that direct connection to God, open at a moment's notice if we need it when we're in a tough situation. All right, watch and pray. Be vigilant. Be vigilant in prayer. Have that prayer life going. The more we pray, the more we'll be aware of Satan and his attacks. So those are the two things that we need to do. We need to be sober-minded, all right? Get your head in the game, get your head in the book, and we need to be vigilant. We need to be pay attention. We need to watch and pray. Now, in verse 8, Peter gives us further description of the enemy. It says here, your adversary, the devil, gets this. He walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Just two little thoughts here. Walking about has the idea of, of as a hunter, all right? He is a hunter. He's walking about as a, a roaring lion. That word walking has the idea of to walk completely around. It's not that he just sits still and waits for the, the prey to come to him. He is actively, aggressively looking for people, all right? He doesn't stay in one location. He is stalking his prey. Now, contrary to popular thought, all right, he is not everywhere at the same time, all right? Satan is not omnipresent like the one true living God is, all right? But he does have an army of demons at his disposal who can do his dirty work for him. So get 
excuse me, get in the game, pay attention. There's an army of spiritual enemies stalking you. They are hunting you. And then it says, <coughs> seeking whom he may devour. He is hungry. Satan's hungry. All right. And it's just not that he's a little peckish. You know, he needs a little snack before going to bed. No, he is starving. He, he is hungry. He is hungry for what? He is hungry to destroy you. All right. Now, Satan is not a cartoon figure dressed in red with little pointy ho uh, horns and a pointy tail and a pitchfork sitting on your shoulder like we see him so often described. In fact, Satan would love us love it if we thought of him that way because then he, we kind of discredit him. We don't pay serious enough attention to him. <coughs> but he is a real threat who seeks not just to hurt you, but to destroy you. Now, he may not be able to keep you from going to heaven, but he can mess up your life and destroy your testimony. He might not be able to discredit you before God, thank the Lord Jesus, but he can discredit you before people here on earth. And I have heard it said that Satan doesn't worry so much about the unsaved, all right? They're already on his side. They're already going to hell. But he does worry about Christians because they might lead others to a personal relationship and salvation in Jesus and, and, and take them from going to hell with him to spend eternity instead in heaven with Jesus Christ. And he hates that. He doesn't want that to happen. So he is going to do his best to discredit you, destroy you, to devour you so that you lose your testimony. He loves to destroy Christians and their testimonies so that they cannot reach others for the kingdom of God. So Satan is hungry and Satan is hunting. He is a deceiver. He's diabolical. And what can we do about it? Verse 9 tells us, he says, resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now, I want you to notice, first of all, what we are supposed to do. All right. This is the thing the Bible tells us that we are supposed to do. All right. We are to resist. That word resist has the idea of standing against. All right. It means to oppose fully. It means to take a complete stand against a 180 degree contrary position all right no question no debate no discussion no hemi he, he, waffling <laughs> all right uh, saying well is it really bad or no anything that satan is for anything that satan does uh is wrong and we as believers need to be against it we need to resist it we are to be totally opposed to anything and everything that satan does all right and, and as we are in the word and as we develop that attitude of prayer then we will know we'll be able to understand who the devil is and what the devil is all about and we are to oppose anything that is not of the word all right the written word the bible or the living word jesus all right so we need to resist the devil all right and it says not about the big attacks all right sometimes when we think about satan and attacking you know we think about murder and stealing and immorality and those kind of things but we must resist the little issues that satan throws us at at us as well things like gossip perhaps Things like guilt, feeling guilty when we need to claim the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. The guilt that drags us down and handicaps us from being everything that God wants us to be. Gluttony, all right? I, I threw that in just because it's a third G, all right? Gossip, guilt, gluttony. You know, it, it just drives me nuts when I see preachers that, you know, they're up preaching hellfire, damnation against sin, and, and yet they, they're overweight because they overeat. All right, they they have some issues to deal with as well. They shouldn't just be po pointing the fingers at others. They need to be po pointing the fingers at themselves. All right, so we must resist the little issues, not just the big issues. Now, notice what we are told, what we are not told to do. All right, what we are told to do is resist. All right, James even says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. All right, but what we're not told to do is fight. All right. Uh, we are never told in scriptures to fight Satan. So I say this and care for you and, 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 and I say it humbly as well. But please be careful of well-meaning believers who are very enthusiastic and excited about strategies that they encourage others to use against Satan. And, and things that are not found in the Bible. Because there are these, I, I believe they're well-meaning, but... Uh, <laughs> Lily's out downstairs. All right, you hear her down there. That's our granddaughter. But anyway, uh, and you know what? This is the third time. I mean, I'm going to move on.
before I say something I shouldn't say. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, things I found in the Bible. All right, but they 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 do seminars, they do classes, they do workshops, and, and they they it's all about fighting Satan. And 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 the Bible doesn't tell us to fight Satan. All right, the Bible doesn't tell us to bind Satan. All right, there is a parable that Jesus talks about binding the strong man of the house, but it's not. A lesson that's telling us that we need to bind Satan. All right, we're not to declare victory over Satan, and you know, and get out of here, Satan. We're declaring victory over you. That's not in the Bible. Taking territory from Satan. All right, I do believe that Satan does have, as I mentioned earlier, his army, and he probably has a well-structured army. He probably has his higher-level people and, and and demons, and then some lower-level demons, and you know, a hierarchy like uh, like an army would have. But you know what? We are never told to go after the various powers over the cities, all right? Because this is what some of these well-meaning believers will teach, is that you need to go to the highest place in your community here uh, in Towns County. It would be Brasstown, Baldwin. I think I'm looking. Yeah, it, it's right here, all right? That's Brasstown, Baldwin. It's the highest spot in Georgia. It's 4,784 feet Hi. And so there would be some of these folks that would say, hey, you need to go up there to the top of Brass Mount Bald and pray against the general, Satan's general or the principality, the power that is over the county of Towns County or Union County or Northeast Georgia or the state of Georgia, whatever you'd want to say. All right. You need to bind them. You need to claim victory over them from the highest spot. And, 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 and that's what we need to do. And, and they'll say, you know, go to Chicago, top Sears Tower, Willis Tower. You know what? And, and they do this, these these seminar folks. And, and But you know what? They do it, and then they leave. And the city is no, it's no better. Why? It doesn't work. The Bible doesn't tell us to do those kind of things. He does tell us that we need to resist. Yes, the Bible does talk about casting out demons. All right? And I believe that there is a place for that even today. All right? But it is not to be the focus of our following Jesus. Our focus in following Jesus must be Jesus, all right? We are not to look for and find demons in every situation, all right? Somebody has uh, a sickness, and, you know, it's the demon of cancer. Somebody has an addiction, it's the demon of smoking. Uh, there might be other bad habits that we have, uh, the, the habit of, the demon of oh, biting our nails, all right? Uh, various other shortcomings, procrastination, I, I have that habit, but is that a demon? No, it's not a demon. Yes, these are serious issues, but they are not necessarily satanic, all right? Now, the Bible does tell us that there are three sources of temptation that we face as believers, all right? There's satanic, and that is the spiritual battles, you know, faith, doubt, guilt. There's the world, all right, material battles, such as discontent, covetousness, greed. There's, and then the third one is the flesh. Physical battles, such as immorality, addictions, overeating, oversleeping, those kind of things. All right? So Satan and his demons are not always the source of our trials and temptations. Sometimes it's things that we have brought on ourselves that we are dealing with. But he can use the world, and he can use the flesh, and he can even use well-meaning Christians whose focus on him takes the focus off Jesus, and thus it accomplishes his purposes, all right? One of his biggest strategies is to get people to take their eyes off Jesus, and if he can do that by drawing attention to himself, he's going to do it, all right? So be aware of Satan, all right? Uh, get your head in the game, uh, pay attention, uh, you know, read your Bible, pray, uh, understand who the devil is, but then at the end, Peter ends verse 9 with a reminder that other believers are facing trials, temptations, and persecutions. How many times have we as believers, we've gone through a series of disappointments, discouragements, trials, temptations, troubles, and it's like, oh, you know, I am going through so much, and it's all, woe is me. But Peter says, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. Every believer goes through these kind of things. He says, here, the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. We are not alone. You are not alone. Now, we are not the first to experience the attacks of the devil. All right? Many others in the past have experienced the attacks of the enemy. And many others, even now, in other parts of the world, are experiencing the attacks of Satan. And many of them have resisted. They have done what the Bible has said. They have been in the Word. 
They have been a people of prayer, and they have resisted the, the devil. And many of them have been victorious. Maybe not in the way we might define victory. It might have cost them their lives, but they have been victorious. They are victorious nonetheless. And so may that be an encouragement to us as believers today as we resist the devil, knowing that we are not alone. Others have done it, and others have made it through. So I want to close today with this classic passage from uh, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning verse, do I want a verse in 10? I'll start in verse 10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, all right? Uh, as we go through time, as persecution comes, our enemy is really not governments. Our enemy is not uh, different kinds of philosophies and, and people that will take away our freedoms and that kind of thing. No, it, it is a real spiritual battle, all right? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of weakness in, in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to, get this, withstand, all right, to resist in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, be ready to share Christ. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And get this, praying always, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end, being watchful. Get your head in the game, pay attention with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Amen. All right. Not an easy message to preach, but it's something that's very important, something we need to be aware of. Get your head in the game. Pay attention. Amen. All right. Hey, as I mentioned earlier, Pastor of Calvary Alliance Church in Hiawassee, Georgia. Uh, I, I've, I've lost my card that has my email address. Let me say that first. All right. If you have any questions or comments about the message today, you can email me, Schmidt. S-C-H-M-I-D-T, and then the number 65, bkschmidt65 at gmail.com. You can also get me at our website, calvaryalliancechurch.com. You can see lots of good things about our church there. And then there's a place for emails there as also. And then we are part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance, cmalliance.org, which is a wonderful, wonderful uh, denomination that focuses on Jesus and sharing Jesus. All right. We have our Sunday morning worship service at 1030 Sunday mornings. And uh, I just love our church. And we have great people. We come in. We have a great time of fellowship. It's family. Have a good time of worship. And nothing fancy, all right? We don't have lights and cameras and TV and and, and all that stuff, smoke machines and, you know, all that. But we do have people that love the Lord. And we invite you to come and worship with us. Tuesday morning, we have our adult Bible fellowship. Oh, and I always forget. We also have our ABF Sunday morning because I don't have a card. I need to make, I'm just going to make new cards, I guess, sometime if I have time, at 9.30. But the life that God rewards, and I think we're going to be in our fourth week, and it's been a lot of uh, good information, uh, good encouragement. David Wilkerson's The Life That God Rewards. Uh, appreciate Mark and Carol that are leading that study. That's at 9.30 Sunday mornings in our fellowship hall. And then Tuesday morning, we have our other ABF at 9.27 in the fellowship hall. And we have started a study on the, on, on God, knowing God, and how we are to be theologians. We are to study about God, not just with the purpose of getting a lot of head knowledge about God, but so that we know God better in our hearts and have that relationship with Him. Wednesday evening, prayer meeting. Please come to prayer meeting if, if you're within inside of Brass Town Ball up there. All right, you're within driving distance of Calvary Alliance Church, and we invite you to come pray with us. And then we do have our huddle, which is the odd Fridays of the month. First, third, on occasion, fifth this is a month that has a fifth friday so it's a bonus huddle so what we do on bonus huddle days is we go and we have breakfast together at the huddle house all right so gentlemen if you'd like to join with us that will be at 8 30 at the huddle house in hiawassee they have great food they have a good breakfast mvp uh i think is what they call it good food i like their sausage biscuits uh, really good sausage biscuits so i invite you to join with us with that all right well hey thanks for joining us with the
with us on the video today. Again, if you have any questions, prayer requests, uh, email me, bkschmidt65 at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. God bless. Have a great week.